All right, well, welcome to part two of the part arms class. Um, this one builds on the previous class we had on Tuesday, which is now up on YouTube. Um, not professionally produced, but hopefully it gets the points across. Um, and it will be something you can use going forward. If you haven't looked at that one yet, um, I recommend taking a look at that, not obviously now, but I'm gonna give you some background about the historical basis for the pot arms and for the reenact or the uh, rediscovery of the pot arms in the 1990s with the tournament companies. So for today, um, we're gonna talk about um, the fighting in and hosting the pot arms. So we're gonna cover very briefly sort of reprise we talked about last time. Um, but then we'll look at it from both the combatants perspective and from the host perspective. Um, the host, I'll throw in a little bit of gallery perspective there as well. Um, we'll also look at the core elements that define a pot arms and sort of they're all, uh, they, all historical ones and modern ones have these things in common. Um, and then we'll talk about a framework to help um, guide, depending on what size pot you want, some things to sort of best practices and maybe things to stay away from. Um, we've covered in the previous class the idea of renown. We'll talk about that again. Um, turning in general, we'll have a whole class just on different kinds of medieval tournaments, but um, at least that gives you a piece of what we're talking about today. Um, and then we'll talk, we've talked about the pot, possibilities for the pot today, um, anchored in the fact that there's a very wide a number of different applications today, um, not only in the SCA or in the School of St. George, but across the spectrum. So in HEMA or in Harnischvechten and in the sort of rebated steel communities and in that, it gives a good opportunity for a sort of crossroads. And the folks in Alaska have done some with this, so um, not new. Um, so just as an operational thing as we go along today, um, I'll pause periodically for questions. So if you can indicate at that point, hold your questions till we get to that point. Uh, and then I'll uh, try and see that you're there and uh, we'll do questions periodically every few slides or so. Alrighty, let's roll. So reviewing last time, uh, the big aspect, the underpinning, uh, underpinning concept that makes all this stuff work is really the medieval idea of renown. Uh, this is the idea that all people fighting in a tournament, all combatants fighting in a tournament will earn renown. And as Jeffrey Charnay liked to say, he who does more is more worthy, so they'll get more renown. Uh, it is possible to lose renown by losing sight of the um, what the tournament's purpose is, but generally it, the whole thing is a celebration of the sort of full spectrum of chivalric virtues, including prowess. So you have to be careful when setting up a pod that you don't over sort of overwrite the prowess with too much heraldry and too much uh, silliness, for lack of a better word. Um, some of that's fine, but you don't want to lose the focus. Um, and the idea is to create a stage on which chivalric deeds could be done. So the idea is that you're gonna be creating an atmosphere in which it encourages sort of people to make chivalric gestures on the field, both in terms of prowess, but also in terms of generosity, fidelity, et cetera. Um, and the trick is to try and create a stage whereby that's uh, more likely to be chosen than the other thing. This is why it, the type of combat you choose can actually make a very large difference about how that looks. Um, to make that stage effective and to encourage the renowned aspect, uh, heraldry, armor, the, le the fighting field itself, um, these things can all really contribute to um, the encouragement of those deeds of, of renown. Um, and it can also take away from it if you don't put enough effort into it. The PA offers an opportunity, as we'll see when we look at it from the combatant's point of view, of sort of having a special place where um, you can show your interest in your sincerity by prepping for it, um, both mentally and physically. Um, and then finally, you don't wanna lose that prowess aspect. That was something we talked about last time. We'll talk about it again as we get into fighting at it. Um, it's a fighting event. It's not a, uh, a play, um, but it should bring in prowess and infuse that with the rest of the ideals. So ideally you'll be seeing the full spectrum as I mentioned before. And these things are anchored in sort of borrowing actively from romances. So it's a kind of teaching tool um, historically, but one designed to um, augment the prowess with other virtues as well. Um, anchored in the 14th and 15th century, but with experience starting in the 13th century, as we talked about last time, more on the history of the first part of the class. Do we have any uh, questions on the review? Obviously I spun through that really fast, but uh, we have a lot of material to cover today. So any questions on that part? All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and push on. So I'm gonna introduce a new character today. Uh, this is King René d'Anjou, mid 15th century King of Sicily. 
um, who was a noted patron of the chivalric arts. Uh, he wrote a number of tournament books. The one you see there, Le Livre de Tournoi de Wahouane, um, is probably his most famous one, but he uh, both commissioned and worked on a number of other books, a book of love and a book of uh, tournament of Samar. Um, these are, will sort of touchstone on, on René today, because even though he's mid 15th century, um, he really does sort of summarize in his book, Livre du Tournoi du René, summarizes for the mid 15th century at least, uh, what was going on in the field. Uh, this has never been published in a sort of mainstream publisher in English, though there have been some French editions. Um, and René himself is kind of a fascinating character because he knows everybody in the mid 15th century um, and he takes part in a lot of the major campaigns and such, but he's also this fantastically uh, generous tournament patron. And because he recorded these books and had them recorded or um, had them produced, in addition to him writing some of the stuff for it, um, we get an idea of what was going on in the mid 15th century. Um, the book in there, King Renew and His Seven Queens, is a biography that you can find. It's fairly old, so you might be able to find it on archive.org or something like that. Um, and it's a good biography for Rene. It talks a little bit about these feats of arms. We'll talk about some other contemporaries of Rene as well, Olivier de la Marche, uh, Jacques de Lelaine. Uh, these people were all involved in what amounted to a giant tournament circuit around uh, Western Europe and extending into Eastern Europe, though we know less about that because not that much has been written about it. Uh, the Germans were also actively involved in this, but uh, most of the German medieval scholarship stays locked in, in German academic um, discourse, uh, kind of isolated, a little bit like the Iberian or Spanish stuff is. Um, so most of what we're drawing from is, is Anglo-French, but there are other places to draw from as well. As we talked about last time, uh, this is primarily a noble slash military endeavor. However, um, these ideas spun over into the uh, combatants in the cities, or not combatants, but burghers in the cities, were uh, actively in involved too, at least in the mid 14th century, with creation of these sort of romance tournament societies. Um, we don't know much about them, except that they existed and they had a few festivals, but we have no details like this. Um, so Rene, you'll see Rene pop up throughout this as sort of exemplars I'll draw from his tournament book. Um, in addition to infusing it with other sources and other images that we've got. So somebody to go look up if you're really interested in running these things a lot, Renee's tournament book, um, highly recommended. So from the participants point of view, um, you can see these guys, they're from Europe. I believe they're taking part in the 1415 uh, group. And while they do mostly uh, war stuff, this is what Jeffrey Charnay would have been talking about in terms of tournament kit. He noted in his book that uh, tournaments were um, had special requirements for gear and that they were uh, relatively expensive. Well, that can sort of follow today too. Um, this fellow um, in the knightly role has his squire with him and his men at arms as well, um, participating in a European live steel tournament. Um, but the idea is the same. This is sort of a circa 1400, 1390 to 1405, somewhere in there, sort of tournament appearance. You know, he's got the plume on the helmet, the heraldic surcoat, uh, which is carried through on his device and such. This is a really bold presentation, but one that you might have seen uh, replicated at tournaments throughout the end of the 14th and into the 15th century. So it's a, a good sort of touchstone. Um, the first requirement there is that as a combatant, is you're trying to do honor to the hosts, uh, the gallery, and to your fellow combatants. So this involves the salute, but it's also everything that you do. Great chances to show generosity out on the field, um, not only with something that you might know in the essay as a point of honor, but just being particularly respectful of the opponents and everybody else, and moreover, expressing a true joie de combat, enjoyment of the fighting. Um, that needs to rub off on folks. The PAW format by its nature being a challenge tournament we discussed last time, uh, it can, uh, that challenging is sort of a measure of how well you're doing. Because if you're challenged all the time by a lot of people, that tells you you're doing well. If you're not being challenged very much, then probably you're making some mistakes and need to work on your presentation, not necessarily in the physical kit, but just in your comportment. So to do honor to all these people, to the ideals and to your uh, opponents and whatnot, you wanna prepare, you wanna present the best possible presentation. It's not about show for show's sake, but the show is designed to show respect for everybody else. Um, also, to some degree, to a lesser degree, pride in your own sort of excellence, but basically it's there to honor the day and the chivalric ideals as a whole. So that's the first thing. So as I mentioned before, Charnay noted it was expensive. I noted the 
uh, heraldically uh, cohesiveness, that's kind of a tournament marker. You wouldn't necessarily go out and war with all these things, although you might. Um, but in tournament, you definitely show up and put, put on the full show. Uh, you can see times where you have like the consorts wearing the same sort of heraldic um, penalty as the combatants themselves, not necessarily with the arm, but with the patterns rep replicated and whatnot, uh, favors and all that sort of thing. Um, and you want to bring out your best stuff. Uh, many people who do this seriously basically create a kit that they use mostly just for this. Because um, obviously, if you've got a reasonably nice and expensive helmet, then getting that bashed up in weekly practice is not necessarily what you want to do. So people oftentimes get a special visor or you know, some special fighting clothing and that sort of stuff. And then clean up the armor, uh, repaint the shield, do all that stuff, bring pennants and banners, uh, try to make as uh, good an impression as you can physically on and around the field. Um, the other thing that's really good to do is to bring gifts. And this is not just for the tournament victor, but things you notice on the field that might have been done that particularly impress you. It might be a technique or prowess, but it might also be a gesture, an appearance, um, a movement, anything like that. Um, and this can be done, you can wait till the end, um, as we've sort of rolled into a tradition of, or you can actually interrupt the action right there and make your presentation. So um, I've done that before. We used to make little uh, Company of St. George pins that we would wear. And we would stop a tournament, any tournament, even an SCA crown, we'd walk out on the field after the fight was done and say, hey, that was a magnificent thing you just did. Here, take this token of my appreciation. Um, and I just want to tell you how cool a thing that really was. Because remember, the idea is to reinforce renown. So gifting and uh, uh, pumping up the gear is how you do that. You uh, try to make the event as special as possible. Um, and then finally, you prepare. And I think I like to recommend that my squires and such read uh, some romance literature, something right before they go out. Not necessarily that day, but in the weeks running up to the PA to get yourself into the kind of mindset. What are we doing here? Uh, and sort of getting into the groove of how this stuff works. Um, and so those things on the physical or mental side, and then on the physical side, just getting your gear together. And then of course, fighting to make sure you're uh, fighting well on the day. All these things put together should make an impressive appearance on the day. And it's not so much pressing for personal pride reasons as to um, try and build up the honor for the day for everybody, not just you. So here's some more European fellows um, who have put together late 14th century sort of presentations. This is where that sort of SC idea of the 14th century mafia kind of comes from. Um, not from Europe, but from the prevalence of 14th century kit. Um, the nice thing about this particular era as opposed to the 15th century is that it's really flexible. You can use it in a lot of different ways and it's very heraldically expressive. If you've got a cap a pied 15th century suit of plate, there's less chance for heraldic display um, going on. You'll notice the fellow there with the, um, I'm not sure what it is, it's a lion probably on the top of his helmet. Um, most likely you wouldn't be fighting with that, but you might use it for the helm show. Uh, I do know people who have created rubber and foam crest to match their gesso one that they put on. Historically, they're made of gesso and leather. Uh, it wouldn't hold up for very long as a great big target. Um, there are some people making them today, but they're horrifically expensive, somewhere in the $800, $900 range. Um, but you, know, you can make your own. Sometimes just plumes or a torso mantle can do that. Um, but just you can see the cohesiveness that all the combatants sort of present in a tournament context. Um, something that uh, they have the advantage of castles and so on that we don't have, but they at least have um, put in a lot of time trying to get the gear together. Much easier now than it was in the 1990s we were trying to do this. Um, as I mentioned last time, we had five armors in the Company of St. George, which made it easier for us. Um, but it's, there are fewer armors working today in the United States than there were working then. But there are a lot more in Europe and around the world, so still possible to get stuff. And of course, you can certainly make it. So turning for a moment to King Rene's tournament book, he actually illustrated these as mid-15th century, not things they actually used in tournaments, but um, things he thought would be good. And so you can see that base, great bassinet helmet with a grill, um, and then the cap on it's really kerboily, uh, boiled leather, and then on top of that sits the crest and mantle and all of that. Um, you'll see when we get to some of his tournament images, you'll see combatants wearing exactly those. Um, then the cuirass, it's not clear whether this cuirass is steel or whether it's kerboily. I tend to believe it's steel because of the coloring, um, but he does mention that some people wear uh, boiled leather on their uh, for tournaments as well, probably under the heraldic fighting clothes. Um, not really different than we use plastic and Kerboile is kind of a polymerized uh, vegetable tan leather anyway. So 
Um, those things can be done, certainly. And then they notice the swords, two kind of interesting things on those. One, they're a baited steel sword, no point really. Um, many tournaments they would say we're not going to do thrusting. Um, and these would not be conventions that would be published like some sort of massive agreement the way we might do today, but rather they would just be set out by whoever the tournament uh, organizer is. This is what we're going to do. Early In the earlier period, people would just get together and decide, well, we're not going to do thrusting today because I don't really want to catch a shot to the throat and I don't have any good armor there. So um, that's how those conventions sort of got started. And then the baton below is more like a mace. Um, but that tradition comes out of the Behor tradition where you're using sticks against Kerboili to show the stuff without actually using a baited bladed weapon. Um, that's a long tradition going back at least to the 13th century. Um, the SCA's uh, rattan combat kind of replicates the medieval Behor, I think, better than the rebated steel one. Um, but these are things that Rene thought might be kind of useful in and around the tournament field. Now I'll go ahead and pause here for questions. Do we have anything or questions or comments on the last couple slides? Uh, yes, I've got one on the previous slide for the center helmet had the pelerin or the scale pelerin. Gosh, I can see you but not hear you. Okay, um, so moving on from there, uh, since I can't get Josh's question, I'm sorry, Josh. We'll have to if you can type in the chat box, I'll uh, pull it from there. Yes, there was some scale on, the, on that fellow's aventail in the previous slide. Um, you can see it here where he's got a scale aventail. There's a fellow in uh, France uh, that makes those today, or I've seen other people do them as well. So kind of interesting. Um, all right, so the heraldic expression that they all show, this goes back to the, this Manessa Codex is from 1304 to 1340, shows a lot of tournament scenes. We looked at some of the slides last time, um, but you can see the heraldic cohesion on the combatant's horse and his shield and his crest. Everything sort of flows one to the next. Um, and on the other picture with the Chapelle de Fer on top of the helmet, kind of an interesting crest that's actually a helmet in itself. Um, you've got the horse trappings, and then his surcoat and the shield and all the rest of it. Um, yes, he replicates that fairly well, um, but even for a pie, you can see it's even more sort of polished up and more effort is made, new, newly painted and so on. Um, nowadays, we have machine embroidery and silk, silk screening and block printing and stuff, so you can really do a lot of work with this fairly easily um, to bring sort of the heraldic flavor out. So this fellow is Anton von Aiden. He's the sculptor who actually did our Company of St. George medallions just showing his sort of kit. That would be a pretty nice, but sort of ideally idealized kit for the 14th century with the shield and um, all the rest of it. They fight with rebated steel, but all the gear is kind of there and you can see it there. So um, hopefully this gives some inspiration for kit. I mean, there's, I could have hundreds of slides of people in the last 20 years who have built up nice harnesses. So uh, there's lots to look at. If you've got a particular period you're interested in, uh, we'll talk about that in another class, but um, certainly send the chat reference through and I'll talk about it a little bit today. Um, so things you want to do on the day of the tournament. Um, you want to be very bold in your presentations. Um, initially, there's usually a uh, introduction mode and you want to come up and introduce yourself. Often combatants will carry their pennant when they do that. Um, show respect and all. Be you know, bold in a knightly chivalric sense. Um, this is not a place really for timidity. Um, you want to be bold, but also respectful. So it's a nice, strong balance. Um, and this includes, you know, the consorts, the gallery, the tournament sponsor. Uh, they're all part of the day. They're all part of the celebration. So that should go all around. And a little bit goes a long way. What I found is that the, when this really gets going, all of the gear and the fence and the banners and the polished up armor all serves to help encourage people to make the right gesture. Uh, when the opportunity presents itself. So everybody there has sort of a responsibility for that. Um, so that's the first thing, sort of express yourself boldly. Uh, being sincere in the salute and in um, everything that you do during the day goes a long way. One of the things that I like to counsel people to do is, while it was probably more medieval to have a herald come and speak for you, it actually works better if you speak for you because we get the sincerity. We, the Herald could say anything and we don't know if that's really what's in your heart or not. Um, but even if you think you speak broken, one of the best introductions we ever had was a guy who stuttered, but it was clear that the sincerity was there 
And that's really what matters, not the polish. The polish is okay if you have it, but uh, the sincerity is where it's at for that. So if you're sincere and you express yourself during the course of the day, while you're on the field, what you think about your opponents, uh, remarking on cool stuff they did or, not, or gear that they have, that stuff reinforces both the renown and the idea that we're all out there for the same chivalric purpose. Now, these things should be done in any tournament, not just a pot arms, but a PA, because of the preparation, because of the um, extra staging, and because of the challenge format, uh, really seems to reinforce it in a more pure way than sort of double elimination list or um, a bear pit or something of that sort. Um, this point, sort of making express to express a joie de combat, I do that, try to make it a point to do that in every single fight. You know, have an obviously good time when you're out there. Um, you can do this with little, you know, whoops and, and laughs and uh, be smiling all the time. Obviously, it doesn't help you much if you're in a closed visor helmet, but um, the, the opponents can tell. It shows through the body language and whatnot. And that, too, is infectious. Um, if you're obviously having a good time, this is not a place to be annoyed that the judges are calling something one way or the other if there are judges. Um, it's, you're just out there to celebrate. In a, eliminate, I mean, in a pot arms, you're never out. So there's no point where a fight takes you out of the tournament unless you get injured or you break a piece of gear. So um, always try to have that joie de combat. That's why you're out there is to show that. So they always do that. Uh, I, I will say. Um, and making it easier for that is that this idea that renown is actually, everyone's going to win renown that day. And very few will probably lose, if any. Um, it's not a zero-sum game like a duel. Um, this is a win-win thing. The question is, who might win more? And as Charnay would say, that depends on who does more, not just in the prowess, but across the board with all the with all of the um, chivalric sort of gestures. So if you're not sure what the chivalric um, sort of ideals are, take a look at Raymond Lull or something like that before you go out and try to make it a point to show as many of those virtues as you can, not for show, but to exercise them. Just like we exercise ourselves in arms, so too the pause is supposed to be an exercise in character. So this is the kind of the fun part. You're looking for opportunities to make chivalric gestures. So what I mean by those, a chivalric gesture is really a moment when you can go above and beyond. So uh, to take an example, I had an opponent once who um, had dropped his pole axe. And yeah, according to the rules, I can go ahead and bash the guy. So it's a very easy thing to have him pick it up again. The question is how you do it. Um, in the SCA, there's sort of a, a tradition of giving points of honor sometimes if you take advantage in some kingdoms, if you hit the guy in the leg or the arm, sort of evening up the fight. That's not an unmedieval thing. It goes back, we see it in parts of all at the end um, when parts of all is fighting fire fits. So it's in the ideology, um, but it's, this is a special place to really exercise that sort of thing. Um, like all these things, sincerity is really important though. You have to be sincere in your presentation or it won't come off well. Um, if you're just doing it because that's the form, you don't understand it or agree with it, that's gonna come out. So John, is that a question I see over there? Yeah. I think I bumped the thing. No, okay. Um, so look for opportunities to make those gestures, you know, to recognize prowess, to recognize the other uh, virtues in the combatants as you see them. Um, and also look for opportunities to give that sort of generosity back to your opponents, to their ladies, to the gallery and people who might be watching. So um, look for those chances. And then finally, um, this is sort of advice for all tournaments, but during the tournament people, unless you're fixing a piece of gear or something, um, try to focus on the field between the fights. Um, look at what other people are doing because you're trying to celebrate what they do. Um, let other people celebrate what you do. Um, if everyone's sort of focused on it, it makes the positive pressure um, that much better on everybody. If everybody's off doing their own thing and talking about, you know, the problems they're facing at work or whatnot on the side of the field, that kind of detracts from it too. Um, now, it's responsible to the host to try and keep the flow of the fighting, as we'll talk about, um, and set up the forms of the fighting so that that's encouraged, so that there's not a lot of downtime and so on. And there is something of an art to that, of keeping the flow moving, um, but also getting the story in there if you have one and integrating the opportunities for um, personal expression and for expression by the gallery and so on. Uh, but it can be done. Um, there's points to recognize that, as I said, on the spot or at the feast or convocation, different options. We'll talk about those as we go. So, what questions might we be having for um, hosting, or I mean, for participating in the PA? Any questions? 
I actually have a question, if that's all right. Can you hear me? Avery, hopefully I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Um, my question was, you were about to go into a story about an example of when someone dropped a polearm, uh, but it felt like you got a little sidetracked. Maybe you might be able to finish off that illustration. All right, Avery, could you repeat that one more time? Because I didn't get it. The headphones were being wonky. Oh, yeah, you bet. Um, earlier, you mentioned an example during a paw in which someone huh. dropped a polearm. I was wondering if you might finish that illustration. Can you guys hear me? It's like we've had a sound interruption. Okay. So Avery, can you ask your question again? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'll type it into the chat as well. I, I apologize. Looking like I'm not getting your sound, unfortunately. I'm not sure why. That's a problem on my end. So let me see if I can change up my speakers here. Do do. All right, try now. Um, all right, I don't know if you can hear me, but in a part earlier, you were talking about an example in which one of your, uh, in which someone dropped in a, a mm -hmm. pole arm and how they used that as an opportunity to extend the pageantry of the tournament. I was wondering if you might finish that example. Sure. So uh, the gentleman still had um, a dagger at his belt. Um, and so by the rules of the day, he's still engaged. And like in SCA format, if you're Florentine, you drop a weapon, you can still, you're still engaged. Um, instead, um, I decided to take the opportunity to say, hey, you know, we'll go back and pick that thing up. I want an actual fight here. I don't want to sort of hit you when you're not really armed. Um, he's like, yeah, I didn't think I could get my dagger out anyway, <laughs> even though I might have tried. So um, that gave him an example. Uh, there's a negative example, too, um, where a gentleman came up outside of a pa, or really it was in the pa de Cetravo, and the challengers were not supposed to challenge each other, but this fellow challenged me. And there was a bunch of other things going on outside that I probably won't go into here, um, not having to do with me, but I ended up being the person on the field who was taking the challenge. Um, and this person was a consummate jerk, put it that way. And so in that case, letting him pick up the ax, same circumstance, um, I did it in a way where he actually, you know, lost, not renown, but um, he continued to look the way he was. Uh, that particular individual, when he came up, brought two pole axes, one very short, one very long, and um, made a very brusque and sort of ugly challenge, and then thrust the short pole axe to me, and the crowd booed at that point. Um, so it's like, no, no, I'll, I'll take the short pole axe, that's fine. And then I made it a mental note that I'm going to win this one 7-0 instead of, usually I'd like it to be fairly close if possible, but um, in this case, it was like, nah. And he broke all the rules, so we're going to do it differently. And so I changed how I went about it there. Uh, just letting him actually, the first guy, pick up the axe, and you're giving the little salutes, like, hey, I want your best fight. I don't want, um, you know, just hit you when you don't have any real defense. Now, if grappling is an important part of the combat form you're doing, or if you manage to get the dagger out and acted like you still wanted to come, I might give him the opportunity to get the axe back if he wanted it. But if he's still coming and we're still fighting, the fight's still going. So... Um, a lot of that is situational and you just kind of have to decide what signals respect the best because um, that's ultimately what you're trying to do with all these gestures is show respect. And if you can call them out for one of the virtues, that's even better. Does that make it, sense? At, at the risk of uh, uh, asking a second question, Not at all. it sounds to me as though what you're describing a little bit is that the martial combat is an opportunity to display and exemplify a set of behaviors uh, however, the decisions you make that aren't martial as to whether or not to let someone regain their weapon or the conversational approach that you take or how you treat the gallery is simply an extension of the display of those values, the same as the fight is. I think that's completely correct. I would agree with everything you said there. Um, the, the whole thing is bound together, and the PA, more than other tournament formats, really gives you a chance to exercise the full spectrum. Um, in places where you have a lot of judged fighting, um, you don't get the same opportunity because you're working within the bounds of whatever the tournament format is. Um, and prowess is important. That's the thing that gets lost a lot is that prowess isn't a part of this or it's subsumed under the other virtues. That's not true. In order for it to really be successful, you need the best fighting and the best expressions of all these other virtues. So I, I think I would agree with everything you said there. And if you want to follow up, feel free. But um, that's exactly the way I look at it, too. Thank you. My pleasure. Any more questions? I think I've got it set up so I can at least hear it if I cock the headphone back. All right. 
then let's go on to hosting a tournament then. So there are three categories really of these things, but in all categories, these are some of your basic considerations. Um, how many people are likely to come and who are they? Are you gonna have sort of people all from one fighting tradition, like an SCA tradition or a Skull St. George tradition or a HEMA tradition, or are you gonna have people mixed? Um, that obviously changes very much how you might approach things for the day. And each one of those groups has different cultures and traditions about fighting gear, about the way the combat works. Um, and so trying to work all that together can sometimes be a challenge, um, but it's worth doing, I think. Uh, tenons, we talked about this last time, tenons are the defenders and venons are the challengers. Um, so you might have a little group of six or, or five tenons um, and you might expect 20 challengers. That's perfectly okay. As we mentioned last time, and we'll talk more about it when we get to the middle size pot arms, I would say don't even those sides up, keep it at six to 20 initially. Mm -hmm. But if you get that mix, you're gonna have to do something to make sure those 20 are still fighting um, throughout the day. And there's some tricks we can talk about for that. Um, but I don't like the idea of evening the sides for a variety of reasons we'll talk about when we get there. But uh, are, you, are you gonna have a theme? A lot of these followed an Arthurian or Alexandrian or classical or historical base, not all of them, but some of them. And if so, how are you gonna work that in? Uh, with what sources are you gonna use? Um, some of that's part of prep, because if you want people to read something or know the story of say Parzival or Horatio at the bridge, you need to give them something to look at before the tournament so they can be on time or you need to work it into the invocation so that they hear it right there before the tournament. I probably tend to do a little bit of both if I'm doing that. Um, the, all those things drive the size and the kind of field you're gonna need. Um, obviously for a small event, you don't need much. A park or a tree or a, in, out in front of a pavilion is all you really have to have. Um, but if you are expecting a lot of people, you'll need to do some more planning. So you might have to have some staff around the field. You might have to have uh, judges or a marshal, depending upon what the rules are, the organization you're fighting in. Um, and you might have to have, you know, uh, drinks and beverage and that sort of thing as well, as well as, you know, the normal stuff, parking, toiletries, all of that. Um, and then what sort of fighting are you going to have during the course of the day? This, we'll get into this more because this is a very big question as to how you're going to run the fighting and what combat form you're going to use. Uh, we'll talk about it when we get to that section, but that also drives a lot of the considerations of how you structure things. And then finally, the mundane stuff, the insurance, safety, like I said, parking, bathrooms, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's nice to talk about these ideological things, but like any other kind of event, you gotta make sure all those other I's are dotted and the T's are crossed to make the day a success. So these are the basic things that you'll need to consider whenever you're thinking of hosting any type of PA. So um, I think I have this out of order that I wanna talk about, but all right, we'll go into this now. So one of the big questions on here is sort of your combat conventions. And if you have um, a single community, so you're working, say, within an SCA context, within a SCOLA context, within a, a HEMA context, you know what those community expectations are. And so that's in some ways simpler. It answers some of these questions for you. Um, but if you're going across community, you've got a lot more work to do to figure out how you're going to uh, sort of bridge the gap between those things. Don, is that a question up there? No. Okay. So some basic traditions that this stuff sort of swirls around um, today, sort of the HEMA or WMA sort of groups. Um, these groups have been around since roughly 2000. Um, and they do have a, a very old issue going back to whether you're doing actually sort of what they call Blosfechten or, or uh, blouse fighting, so unarmored fighting, or whether you're doing harness fact and hiding, fighting in harness. Um, and it's not really resolved even in those communities how you dovetail those tournaments. HEMA has moved towards a sport sort of almost a 16th century fighting uh, format with judges and um, calling blows at four corners, much like in a fencing tournament and such. Uh, but some of those groups are holding things that they're thinking of as deeds of arms, trying to bridge the gap between what HEMA is doing and what groups like the SCA or the rebated steel forms are doing. Um, so if you have those folks involved, you're gonna have certain expectations. Uh, we'll talk about the harness effect and folks in particular here in a minute. Um, these folks are sort of a branch of the HEMA or Western Martial Arts Group, and they're doing what they're thinking of as deeds of arms these days, and they are deeds of arms, um, but they tend to draw almost all the techniques from the fighting treatises, um, which means that they're gripping the sword half sword, so sort of mid sword instead of you know, twice on the handle. 
um, and using a lot of thrusting, in fact, primarily thrusting. There is some pole axe fighting and, and some spear that goes on in there, um, but it's primarily anchored in the fighting treatises. So what you're gonna see in there and what's expected, the rule sets are largely drawn from that, um, which is a little bit different than what you're gonna see with some of these other groups and where they draw from. Um, the expectation, by the way, on harness factin to go up one is that you'll have something resembling full plate. Um, in HEMA or WMA, it's normally a fencing mask and reinforced padded gear of some kind um, and hand protection, that sort of thing. Um, the SCA, of course, the oldest of these groups, um, both rattan and cut and thrust, both work for a pot arms format. Um, Bay Hordes, as I mentioned earlier, um, is were fought with... Um, weapons of ash or baleen from whales or um, other forts of clubs. Um, so it kind of fits in with what the SCA does now. Um, and then you also get their pole axes and spears, which because they're mass weapons work just like pole axes or spears pretty much. Um, there's a much wider variation in terms of what historical means in the SCA and what the tolerance is for historical versus um, sort of a copy of historical, but um, still works just fine. And they've got the chivalric framework as well. Um, the newer form, cut and thrust, can also work. Um, I haven't fought any of those personally, but um, I don't really, I would tend to think of it as more as smash and thrust would be the sort of medieval uh, deed of arms equivalent because there's not a lot of cutting that goes on if you're in harness, but um, it can still work. And um, you could use all of these same things using a cut and thrust base if you wanted to. Um, then I don't really have a good name for these. These are sort of the ACL, BOTN, the sort of a zillion different names for a zillion different leagues now. Um, sort of the rebated teams, rebated sword team combats that you see a lot in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, if the harness affecting guys are using mostly thrusts, the team rebated guys don't thrust at all in most of their combats. So it's exactly flipped, which to me is kind of amusing and strange. Um, but they also use a lot of grappling. So this sort of thing would work over there as well. Um, but if you have sort of an objective judged rules base, uh, you might run into trouble. That's also true with the HEMA format. Um, as to how you would solve this. The thing to remember is if you're going to have some folks coming from that tradition, they're going to have very different combat expectations than your SCA folks will have. And so you need to make your expectations clear right up front. And that'll be in the rules declaration typically. Um, so one of the things that we've done when we've tried to do these cross-community events, I used to do these, we haven't done it in years, but it worked really well when we did it, was a tradition known in the 13th and 14th centuries as a Vesper tournament. Traditionally, this is a place for squires to go before the main tournament, usually the night before on a Friday night, and they would show their stuff in this tournament. Uh, in the very early days of the WMA world, uh, since most of us had SCA background, we held a tourney on Friday night that was fought at that time with shanais and fencing masks. Um, it was designed for people who might want to come to the rebated tournament on the next day, but we didn't know who they were. <laughs> So we wanted them to sort of go through a vetting tournament to make sure that their conduct was right, to express the same attitude. Um, but it was still a competition, just like the tournament would be, um, just a little bit less formal and so on. Um, that's worked pretty well. And if you have a cross sort of spectrum of people coming, you might consider breaking out the different things, like armored versus unarmored, something of that sort. Um, because mixing armored and unarmored, we've done it in the Skull of St. George a little bit. It can work, but it's not the most smooth. Um, and particularly with some of the combat forms, uh, you can, one way if you want to mix it, you can do armor counts, for example, which benefits people that have harness, uh, not the other folks, um, but it's one way that you might resolve this. So these are the main traditions. You also have LARP people, of course, too, but I've never actually had them come to a PA, so I, mean, I don't know too much about how their combat systems work. Um, do I have any questions on these or comments? I do. Go for it. So uh, one thing that we've experienced um, up here in Alaska uh, relatively recently is uh, when you have people from different traditions, uh, different conventions that they're used to, um, for example, some people who are used to calling their own hits and, and some people who aren't, and uh, that was has been an especially big one, or uh, people who are used to a higher degree of armor or, or a, a lesser degree of armor in terms of how they calibrate uh, what sort of a hit is sufficient. Um, co communicating that at the beginning is, is, is one thing and something we very much try to do, but um, the issue that, that I think we've run into a couple of times is that any, 
any imperfection, anything that goes wrong, anytime anyone does anything wrong, some of those resentments seem like they get a little bit magnified. The people who are used to shots being judged are more resentful of people who didn't take a shot they think they should take. And right. that sort of thing. I guess my question is just to you, has your experience been similar and do you have any advice for how to mitigate or manage that? Yeah, I think it has been similar. And it's driven me towards ultimately sort of the conclusion um, that sort of civic fighting, the blow spec and stuff, is in a, just a different sort of category than the armored fighting. And with fighting with different traditions, when I've mixed those things in the past, I don't think I've gotten the best result out of it. Um, for part of the reason you cite, but also um, if the expectations don't line up what we're doing out there, then it makes that a distraction from all the chivalric renown stuff that's supposed to be going on. Um, so I think that could be an issue. The technique that I use is that breakout technique that I use for doing a separate tournament for that sort of thing that stands alongside it. But if we, you know, like in Hawaii, we didn't have a ton of people. There wasn't really room for that. We didn't have the infrastructure or the time. Um, so you might not even be able to do it. I think it becomes probably an education issue, but it's going to be a tough one, I think. Um, you guys have a unique mix up there. Um, but you all, that means you also have the opportunity to figure out some things that work um, that you can communicate back. Maybe a session before the tournament to sort of talk about expectations and exchange ideas on different sort of traditions back and forth <laughs> across the table. That might work, perhaps. I think uh, we had a question also from, uh, from Josh. Yep. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. All right, so down here in Pensacola, I mostly fight within the SA in either Rattan or Cut and Thrust. I found that the system tends to work well with both, and there is a push for Cut and Thrust to Armor is Worn that has been coming out, I believe, of Anstiora and starting to spread. Yeah, we make more ability to hold a pot arm type event within the SCA, both fighting with the Steel community and the Rattan community and go back and forth between the two. Yeah, I think I'd like to see more of that. That's part of the reason I'm doing it in this format is so that we can, you know, get some people from across the aisle to, to work. But I, but I think, you know, BJ's um, caution here is one that I've seen too. Um, the SCA has a culture of its own that works really well within it, even between cut and thrust and, and the rattan communities. Um, going outside of that, though, they do not have a judge, judge community. And so that's where a lot of the issues might be. Um, I personally do not enjoy the judged formats because I don't like the responsibility being moved off of me and onto the judges. Um, I think that it takes away from that renown and that pressure on the combat. Um, and we've had this discussion for years in an SCA context, how to solve the problem with the guy who doesn't take blows. And after thinking about that for a long time, my conclusion was, you don't do anything about it unless he's a danger because the renown mechanism works against him. Um, they're known, they become, they're a jerk, but they're a famous jerk then. So everyone knows they're a jerk. And yes, you can steal tournaments and that's unfortunate, but do you really? I mean, all it really does is give you a piece of shiny metal on your head ultimately. You're still a jerk and everyone knows that. Um, so I think the renown mechanism can work really well in an SCA context. If you're coming across different traditions though, um, those mechanisms they have great faith in it and, and sometimes have a uh, total lack of faith and the lack of judging. Um, they don't agree with that mechanism at all. And I think if those get back gaps are too wide at the start, you're going to probably have um, a chasm that's going to be hard to fill. So maybe BJ can bird dog some of this for us as she goes and um, we can talk about other mechanisms to try and bring it together. But my suspicion is that you'd have to do more acculturation before the tournament to make that closer. And I'm not even sure it's possible. Anyone else want to throw in on this one? Thanks for BJ and Josh. That was helpful. All right. Whoops. Helps if I go onto the right screen. Okay. So the big thing here from a host's point of view, the big picture thing you want to keep in mind is you want to make sure that focus is going all day. And there's some elements to that that are important. The preparation's important, all of that. Um, but there's some, if you think about it in this way, I found this helpful for me anyway. So I want to make sure that the attention is focused not only on the field, but on what component combatants are doing. And that's why the list enclosure and the penance and the armor and all that's so important. 
um, because it focuses the action on what's going on. I think of this very much as a, a stage on which you're supposed to do these actions. The only caution I have about using the term stage is that that implies that it's acting. And it shouldn't be acting, it should be sincere. Uh, I suppose if you're a really good actor, I won't be able to tell, but in most cases, under the stress of a fight, you can tell. Um, so if you blend the prowess, then that wipes out just the acting alone thing. Um, and so ideally, you create the stage. And so everything is set for that, for that focus. Um, the tone, the, the patron or the sponsor of the event really is the one who's responsible for that. Um, making sure that we have a chivalric tone. There's a range of things that might include, but um, it's really useful to try and keep that going. I found that um, you get support from these sort of officers, so a Knight of Honor. Um, what that person is, is a person who sits with the gallery, who's an experienced combatant, and sort of helps to either explain or, or convey the gallery's wishes back to the field or however it goes. Um, they're the interface, the liaison officer, if you will. Um, in, that's supposed to be someone of exceptional renown who's highly respected as a combatant, but also for their courtesy and generosity. In practice, because we have limited people, it ends up being who's injured doing that role. Um, so um, nonetheless, you know, within a limited group, they're supposed to be fill all those roles anyway. Um, the head marshal, if you are working in a tradition that has that, that person actually plays a role too, because if they're too aggressive with the rules, that can dramatically take away from the chivalric tone of the event too, or if they don't enforce them enough, uh, kind of in the case that Bernadette was talking about. Um, either one of those can be problematic. Um, and the patron, whoever's vision it is, the host or whoever's, you know, would be the person you would salute as the fighting takes on, that's, they can help as well. Or any of those people can hinder the event too, but they should all be sort of working as a the tournament staff to help work it out if you have them. In a small pie, you won't have any of those people except the, the patron. And then the heraldry and all that stuff I said before, um, heralds themselves can add an interesting component to it, but they can also be a problem because you don't get to hear from the opponent, so you don't know who's sincere and who's not. Um, actually having the combatant speak, I, I found is useful, at least as far as personal heralds go. Um, having a herald for the field, that's very useful because they can talk about who's on the field and who's decided they've, you know, they're, they're um, uh, yielding to the other and so on. Um, that's all good stuff. And if you put them in a nice 15th century Herald's Tabard or tunic, it's nicely set up, it helps too. Uh, some other things here, the crest, polished armor, all that stuff. That's all part of the stuff I've been talking about as a whole. So that's, those are the three basic things. The other thing you're gonna have to keep in mind that I didn't put on here, uh, we'll talk about more as we get into the middle size pot arms, is flow. You wanna make sure that the action moves along since you've got enough time for combatants to get to the field and be armed and maintain their focus, but not too much that they're sitting around all the time. Um, particularly in between passes, this can become a really big issue. Um, remembering that the basic format is a series of passes. So an invocation followed by uh, sometimes a, um, a commensari, as we call it, a, a group encounter, and then pass one, two, three, four, five. Each one of them is a series of challenges. And then each one of those challenges fought as a new set of challenges keeping that moving and rolling can be a challenge sometimes, particularly the more uh, complex you get with the theme and the story, if there is one, that challenges that, that flow. So you have to be careful if you're gonna have a theme that you don't damage the flow. I would always err on the side of flow over theme if I had to do it. Um, and we'll talk about that's why we have the group encounters in there is for that exact reason in the, in the Company St. George ones. Um, well, do I have any questions on that first of all? That seem straightforward enough. One Go ahead, Arthur. Yeah. All right, can everybody hear me? Sorry, it's first time I'm doing Zoom. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, Brian, I think um, a lot of times when we go into one of these PA type of uh, events, uh, we're all excited and everybody wants to be one of the, you know, the, the, the tenons or, or, or the venons and uh, I can't stress enough that somebody has to be the ringmaster for this three ring circus you got going on. Yeah. Uh, when, when you want to be one of the combatants, uh, you got to make sure that, that, that somebody else is keeping all the pieces of this, this moving. And there is, I think, you know, renown that can be achieved through, through that as well. And so, you know, um, the, the temptation is to, to try and do everything. And, you're, you're really much better off, I think, 
if, if you're going to be the, you know, the host, the sponsor, whatever term we end up, you know, seeing as, as, as normal here, that you are the one making sure that everything's moving and that you're not being distract, distracted by the marshals, you know, calling you to get out on the field for your next bout. Yeah, it's, I think the first, very first one we did, the one in 1992, uh, we had a good team for that. Um, well, it was my vision that everybody sort of flowed along with the thing. And some of that can be handled in very clear articles for the PA. If you lay out what the expectations are, they know what they're supposed to do. We actually did that one without a list table, without any of that stuff. Um, people just kept in mind who they were challenging before and after. And in the smaller ones, that works. When it gets to be larger, though, where you get people from different traditions coming together, that can collide. And I think regardless, I agree that it's easy to get lost, and I want to be a, a tenon or even a venon and then lose that. Um, I've seen that a couple times. Um, happily, that's been the minority, but I have seen it, just like you have. Um, so it's a good caution. Thank you for that one. Is there another question out there? I thought I had a second one. Yeah, just wanted to share a uh, lesson learned real quick for flow and pacing. Uh, keep it reasonable. Trying to do nine passes for mine was a bit much. <laughs> yeah, nine passes can be excessive. I found I don't get more than five, typically, and that's if everything's running smoothly. Um, you can get six or seven if you don't have any things going on between the passes, but uh, five is about the right number. Um, four if you've got a lot of people, and it might even be three if it's a huge one which is why in the larger scale ones, I tend to advocate doing it by stations instead of one field. That creates some other problems, but um, at least the combatants get to progress through the stations then, and their the experience for them is at least good. Much tougher for the gallery, but it's still possible if you stage it right. Renee, one thing, you up? Uh, well, one thing I just wanted to add to that we'll that, worked, that I liked was uh, I put together five or nine passes, but had a few that we could drop out if we're running out of time. And then we kind of read the crowd, what do they want to do? Do they want to do more sword or more pole axe? And, and it didn't matter, we can just kind of adapt on the fly. When asking the gallery for that's really good, a good practice, I think. It's a, definitely a, a best practice. However, you don't want the gallery to get silly with it because once you lose the, that can easily detract from it. And I don't mean silliness in a drawer or something, but I mean, it's easy to lose the focus if you get stuff going too much sideways. But it's good to get, you know, you'll sense the culmination, as Clausewitz would say, when, yeah, I think we're just about done. So we did have six planned, but we're going to go ahead and shorten it up here. Um, or you may have some event happen that you want to stop there because that's been so outstanding. That's where you should end the thing. Um, that's a possibility, too. I'm sorry, Renee, did you have a point as well? I uh, just... Um... You know, I've only participated in the one paw and you know you're talking about how many passes people are going to get to do at the at the one that we did at 40th year um, there were other activities going on between combatants and, and between people where we were visiting with each other and you know the giving of the gifts and the and the talking to everybody so you know it, again it depends on how many people you've got going on but you've got all this other activity that's happening that's also being kind of communally judged so I, I really wouldn't put a really large emphasis on how many fights you got in uh, as opposed to how well you did all of the stuff but that you know first time eventer there i mean i had never fought nepal before so you know i'm going based solely on that one event that's okay well, that means it was well run if there were things for you to do in between that's not always the case but it, it when we first did them we didn't have any events in between and yeah, a couple of the combatants, uh, one fellow from Australia, who was kind of like the Energizer Bunny and would fight buys in between regular <laughs> tournament rounds and prize lists. It's like, oh yeah, I, you know, you need more fighting. Um, so what we did is we put little different sorts of theme melees in between the passes, um, and that solved that. So while we were off calculating who we were going to give the honor of the first set, third challenge based on what they did, the Venons were out there playing around in the field. So, and there's other ways to do that. The gift giving, as you say, and other activities. Um, the challenge can be if you have a lot of other activities to keep the focus, to get the focus re corralled again uh, for the fights you want to show pressure on. Um, but certainly there's a lot of things you could do and a lot of creativity can be put forward in how you set up the other supporting activities on the day. But I think Josh's caution here about not doing too much uh, is also good to keep in mind because um, we all have grand plans and as you know, Von Mulkey said, no plan really survives first contact with the enemy. So um, be flexible, um, as Andrew had said. And you're going to have to be able to shift on the fly and sort of get those feelers out, as Arthur was sort of mentioning. 
you know, to make sure you've got, if the thing's starting to go south, you need to do something just to make sure it's coming back. Um, that's the host's or the patron's responsibility is to make sure that's going the way it's supposed to go. It's pretty easy to read the, the combatants in the gallery, I think, but um, it does take effort. And again, focus on them just as much as the rest of the day. Um, so I think if you keep these things in mind, in addition to flow, um, I think that'll you know make things work well. Initially, the reason the heraldry stuff is on there is because that's usually the spot, you know, tone setting responsibility of the sponsor to make sure that stuff gets going. Um, so getting a sort of baseline of heraldry around the field and if you're going to use a herald, a tree of shields and all those things, uh, someone's got to come up with all that stuff. So you or your, and or your staff, hopefully, that's coming up with those things, sets the baseline and then you can generate excitement around that to get combatants to commit and contribute their own pieces to that. Um, there are different ways to do that. The declaration, which is made before the actual tournament, is helpful with this. And you lay out, write the declaration what the expectations are. So people have time to react. Claire, do I see a question over there? Nope, sorry. <laughs> no problem. All right, any other commentary on this one? All right, and let's go on to the sort of sizes. Now, these are completely, uh, what sort I want? Um, arbitrary sizes, uh, but I've sort of found that the pods sort of break down in three main groups. Uh, the first one is the small sort of errant's defense. This comes right out of sort of your romance tale. You show up under a pavilion or under a tree and you set up your two chairs and your, you know, your fruit and your water or beer or whatever and um, matched weapons and you do the day. You put out a declaration, but it's a small thing and it doesn't require a lot of setup. You can do it informally at a large SCA event or make arrangements at a HEMA event or something and you can do something like this. Um, pretty effectively. You can also do it at your house you know, or in a park, um, bearing in mind the insurance issues. Um, but it's easy to set up. You don't need a fence for that necessarily. I found a single pavilion is a really good base prop for this. Um, and then a couple of period chairs um, and a weapons rack is really all you really need for this. But you could do it without any of those things. Uh, we saw the one last time with Busico where they set up pavilions and all that and then they hung their shields from trees. So there's no reason why you can't leverage something like that. If you're fighting indoors, um, it's a little bit more of a challenge to create the focus in a chivalric sense. Creating the focus on the space is not usually an issue because the space is small, but getting that chivalric tone is harder. If you've got a pastoral scene, you know, outside with green grass and, and so on, it's much easier. Um, but nonetheless, an errant's defense, I think, is the, the smallest sort of version. And again, those numbers are tilted because uh, and this is only the number of tenants. So these are the defenders, not necessarily the challengers. You might have up to three times the number of challengers on each of these, um, depending upon how you lay it out. Um, and then a company level one, this is the one we did for years, the company St. George, where you've got somewhere between six and 12 defenders, and like I said, roughly one and a half to three times the challengers. Um, that works, that is very much helped with a fence um, in a series of pavilions and a shield tree and things of that sort, those being the basic props, uh, along with pennants and banners and that sort of thing. Um, and that's pretty easy to hold without, once you get into the rhythm of it, it doesn't take as much setup work as you've all done it before. Um, you just change the theme up per time and it isn't really difficult to do. The grand version is tougher because you expect a lot more combatants. And so you're gonna have many more flow issues to deal with. Um, and then you're also gonna have to deal potentially with different traditions if you're looking at something that's not at like a Pensac or a Gulf War. Um, and those just require a larger staff. The format really on those is generally more of a stations thing or some large melees. Um, the company ends up being more or less a single field with challenges on that single field and the activity going around that field, whereas the grand one typically is done by stations in different fighting areas, smaller areas, strewn about another area or one big large area with groups. Um, then for each of these, you're gonna have different sort of sizes of spectators to account for. Um, the Aaron's defense, you won't have very many people at all. Usually a consort, a squire, a few retainers here and there, and that's it. You don't have to worry about it too much. Um, households, you know, at like an SCA event or something of that sort, that's different because you now have got a pavilion to deal with and people to watch and manage and so on. And if you're doing it at the public, like at a Ren Fair or something like that, that's a totally different kettle of fish um, because now you have to worry about how this shows to the public and what their interests are in making this thing. Uh, fly. So we haven't done a lot of the public ones, but they do them a lot in Europe. 
uh, because reenactment over there is focused on the audience, not the participants um, in the main. So different sort of tradition. I have fought in a couple of those, um, and it is very different. Um, and then the theme, if you're going to do one, you'll map that to the scoping on these and see how much you really need to do the theme. Um, I, I keep the theme subordinate to the fighting in the main structure. So it's there, but you can always still see the structure of the pond underneath it. Others don't do it that way. They subsume the, the fighting and stuff to the theme. So either way will work. And so these characteristics will basically figure out how much logistics you need to deal with and based on how big a site you're going to have and so on. And they'll drive what sort of combat formats make sense and what you might allow. Um, typically, all of these include the span of chivalric weapons. So the sword in one hand and two, sometimes the dagger, the spear, the poleaxe. Um, shields in an SCA context, that's pretty common. Um, not so much in a HEMA context or in a, a harness vector contest, um, but it goes along with the pod, definitely. So no problem with doing it that way. Any questions or comments on this one? Uh, I do. Sure. So uh, normally when we've done, um, pause that I've done or seen, we haven't divided things up into uh, attendants and venons. So I'm curious a little bit more about that. What is what is the logistics of that usually? Is that how you organize the fights? Can can a tenon only challenge a venon or do only the venons make the challenges? That sort of thing. Sure. Um, if I can, I'll defer that till we get to the company pot arms, but hold, but hold it because it, it'll fit in well there. It does work with the smaller one, um, but in that case, the errants are the tenons. And in theory, everyone's challenging them. This is the downside to being a tenon, is that you don't actually get to challenge in theory. As you say, I've mixed it up in Hawaii so that we had, because we had more of one much smaller group to go across. And if you only have one group and you're in an isolated area, who would be the challengers? It's us, typically. So um, the tenon's idea is that from romance, those are the people who are defending the field and everyone else is challenging them. So um, they would make themselves known. In the declaration, typically it would be uh, like in an early company of St. George might have read something like the companions of the company of St. George being these people, blah, 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 do intend to, def you know, defend this field near the side of the river at this time and place and so on. And then everyone else is a Venon who shows up. Now, you know, what would you do if you didn't have any Venons? <laughs> there's some cases of that historically where they didn't get very many people because there's a war going on or the crown forbade it or whatever, in which case, it ends up going into pickups more like what we were doing in Hawaii, just as a matter of course. Um, so you have to be flexible if you don't get any venons. Uh, but typically, in a declared event of the company size, especially, or in an SCA event, you'll get venons. So that doesn't usually end up being too much of a problem. But I'll, I'll hit it again as we go down to the next slide. So the Aaron's defense um, sort of plays off the classic romance nightly challenge. So you set up an environment. We see one here from King Rene's Book of Love. Um, where the knight has come up all ready to go with the squire on his back, uh, meets the lady, she'll give him a ring or a challenge, a combat, a combatant will come out of the pavilion. So this, we'd actually see the guy on horseback as the challenger coming up to the lady. Um, and then if this were a sort of Aaron's paw, the defender would then come up and the lady may or may not be there. You can do it by yourself or with a, a consort if you want. Um, but it's very much informal. So um, the defender ha picks a place to defend, sets up their gear in an attractive manner, puts the heraldry out, and has already declared that they're going to do it. So the declaration should be published today. Social media is probably the broadest mechanism. We used to use the journal Carnique for that, the Journal of Chivalry um, and Kingdom Newsletters. But um, today, social media is probably the best way to get that around. Um, in the declaration, you would then have a document that would say, here's what I expect. So I'll defend the field with spears, pole axes, blah, blah, blah. Um, I am or I'm not using grappling. There's a lot of ways you can put those things out there. But you set expectations in the declaration for what you're going to do. I have some of those from some of the older chroniques and stuff. I'll be happy to send those around to anybody that's interested in those um, to give you sort of a template of what they look like. Um, and then I found for this level one, if you can have two sets of most things, the weapons especially, um, things like gauntlets are helpful, that's good because then you can do match spears, match pole axes, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, if you have spears, put pendants on them so they flop around and look good. Um, and generally speaking, that works out pretty well. You might even just lean two shields up against the pavilion or against a rock or something and say, you know, tap this one for pole axe and this one for sword and shield, however you want to do it, um, just to capture that sort of thing. 
you want to maintain a little bit of formality. You know, the person should come up and do an introduction, and then you should do a response, um, shake hands, or however you want to say, maybe bump elbows, and come through and say, okay, well, I'm going to, happy to meet your challenge, and here's what I intend to do. Um, if you have a couple of helpers, that's useful because, you know, armor breaks and where in, on earth did I put the, pole, the axe and so on? Uh, they help things run smoothly. Um, but there usually aren't formal passes on this one. It's just one challenge after the next until you run out of challenges. So um, the format for this is a little less formal in terms of the passes. There's a little less work to be done. So you can basically just handle the challenges as they come. And that works pretty well. Now, what if you get overwhelmed? What if there's too many? Well, there's an easy chivalric trick for that. You simply invite one or more of them to be defenders, to be tenants. You know, they give you the fight first. You do the fight, and the ones that really impress you, it's like, that was amazing. So would you consider standing with me to defend this place? Because I can't match your, you know, abilities. So perhaps together we can do a better job at holding the field. Um, there's all kinds of ways to run that and even, it, you know, give yourself a more running chance and not keep people waiting all afternoon while you, you know, work through 12 fights. Um, so use some gestures there. In the first paw, we had, I think, six as defenders and 14 as the challengers. And it took us about halfway through the first pass, and it was clear all of us had at least two fights um, that we were going to need to speed this up a little bit. So we invited two people over uh, after the first pass. And we did it with a lot of, a lot of sort of um, pomp and ceremony. Uh, Sir Robert Holland, who later was one of the, or Viscount Sir Robert, who was later one of the founders of the company, or the School of St. George, we invited him across. He was actually originally a challenger because he had done such a beautiful challenge and then a fantastic set of fights. It's like, yeah, we'd be really honored if you'd stand with us. Um, so he did. And the day went a little bit smoother based on that, uh, just getting the sides a little bit closer. Um, and then... Um, Having refreshment stuff, that's something that, you know, bachelors will forget, but it's useful to have fruit and drink and things of that sort. Um, and a couple of chairs uh, for people to sit around and, and talk in. Um, you don't have to provide chairs for everybody or anything like that, just a small number, and you want to keep it intimate. Um, so that's the whole point of this thing. Uh, show largesse, it's all personal contact and uh, sort of that personal celebration between you and the and whoever the challenger is. Other challengers who are coming or watching, they're going to feed off that too, but um, ultimately, it's about each fight in particular. These are really fun. You can do these with minimal setup and minimal gear. Uh, you can still reach, I think, all the effects of a PA. Um, now, if you're working in an SCA context or something, there may be rules about marshals and stuff that you have to deal with. Um, so if you're in that environment, do check on those things. Um, so these, this is sort of a sample. I just threw this one together. It's not drawn from anything. But these are um, sort of how these things might look. Uh, typically, they're set off with items. So this would be the declaration, which signals your intent to hold this event. And then usually that's read after the invocation. So uh, there won't usually be an invocation at an Aaron's Pot Arms, but the declaration would be something like this. You, know, you give the date in the first paragraph. And then in the second paragraph, I'm talking about how the fights will be done. In the third paragraph, what your challenges, possibilities are. And then fourth paragraph is sort of another reprise of why we're doing the thing. Um, that's pretty much the bare bones there. You could have other things in there, um, but I would circulate this in advance to sort of advertise for who we want to come to the PA. And today that's easily done on social media, um, and then you can take people to do it. If you had a ton of people respond that they were going to come, remembering that people online don't actually show up even though they make reservations necessarily, so cut it down by half. Even with that, you might end up with a situation where um, you may need to invite people over early on to make sure that you're not having a lot of people wait. Um, that's a good sign. So these things sometimes tend to morph as you're going. Um, do I have any questions on the errands, Pa? Sort of informal one, if you will. All right. So uh, if you get the chance, you haven't gotten to set something up at an SCA event, or you have to do it for an S, you know, a SCOLA combat, this is a good one to opt for, because it doesn't require a ton of work um, in setup. Um, although it does require some prep um, and you can easily still get the same effect out of it. So the company one, this one implies that you're going to have the series of tenons chosen by typically uh, defined sets. So, so I've seen it done as a household in the SCA. I've seen it done as we did it, started off doing the company of St. George. Um, I've seen every tournament company that I know of having done it that way. That group tends to do it. We've seen a couple of um, splinters from HEMA schools doing it. 
Um, and then typically these work best with the formal passes. So you're going to have X number of passes. We talked about five being the max. Three is probably the least you want um, somewhere in there. And having some extra ones planned out the way Andrew did, but you know, ability to throw them out or keep them as you want. Um, you can either have the passes be open so that you're just, you don't have a defined event, say, for pass number one, pass number two. Or you could say pass number one we're gonna, is going to be fought with sword in one hand only. Pass two will be fought with a spear. Pass three with, you know, you can do it that way as well. Um, or you can just leave them open. But I like the open format personally because it allows people to fight whatever they want to fight. They can bring out their best or whatever they want to try. And it also leaves the challenges open. So typically the way this would flow across is the venons would array themselves on one side, the tenons on the other. Uh, after the invocation happens, the tenons would come across, or the venons would, or the tenons introduce themselves first typically because they're defending. Then the venons would start with their introductions. Um, and from that, generally speaking, in the company of St. George, we would choose uh, one to three of them, well, three of them for the quality of their introduction to have the honor of the first, second, and third challenge. Um, at that point, we can then go in and let um, the day run the way it wants to. Uh, we do the rest of the pass, and the passes are fought in the order the challenges are made, typically. So it's pretty easy to have people keep track of them before this person and after that person. Uh, it eliminates the need necessarily for a list table where you might have an SCA, um, but you could have that if you wanted one. Um, but we were very sort of aggressive that people should be ready to go when the fight before them was done, and that's sort of a sign of courtesy for your opponent and combatants. But there is an operational problem here. What if you're challenged three times in a row? That's happened to me several times. Then pretty much you're out there for the whole time. So um, it's okay at that point to ask sort of like, oh, what am I fighting this one? And last, last one was dagger. What's this one? It's spear. Okay. And then you come out with that weapon and, and make your best effort to do that defense as best you can. Um, once that pass is done, then typically the combatants would take a short break sometimes, depends on how the flow has gone, and then they would line up again, make a new set of challenges, and then end up fight another pass, and so on. If this is too slow, as I think it was in our second pot arms, then we would start adding what we call intermezzos, or intermediate ones. So the intermediate side would um, we have what we call the commensare, so we have our tradition, I think I have this on a future slide, but our tradition is that people would get together and fight with sword in one hand, to first blood, essentially, which means first strike on somebody else um, or on you, but to three good hits. The caveat being that you'd only do one strike with a given combatant. So as soon as one of the two of you lands a blow, you'd salute and go on to the next combatant. So you get a lot of mixing going on. We did it that way on purpose. Anybody fights anybody, it's not done by teams, at least not the way I ran it. Um, and everybody mixes it up. The passes were structured with venons on one side, tenons on the other, but each of the intermezzos, so between passes, I would add a melee. Um, if we had time. And sometimes, usually those melees would be themed in some fashion. So we're going to have a big fight over the barrier or we're going to do everybody who wants to fight a given thing. And sometimes I'd do those on the fly. Usually they were declared, but uh, sometimes I would change them depending on what I saw. Um, and that gave enough fighting for people who wanted to. It's very much an optional thing. Not everyone has to fight in those. I tried to make that clear, um, but it's a possibility. And in that context, you can mix up the sides. So tenons can fight tenons and so on. Um, and it sort of helps to break it up so that tenants aren't stuck not getting to challenge anybody they might want to fight otherwise. They at least get to fight them. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, the themes. These are some of the ones we've done below. I've seen ones done following parts of all, following some scenes from Mallory, Horatio at the Bridge we did. In Hawaii, we did the Tax Day Pod Arms, uh, Gawain in the Green Knight, St. Christmas Day, all these sort of ones that we've done, that we've seen done. These are all useful. And as a company, Pod Arms, it sort of helps maintain cohesion on the day but it does add complexity. So for your first one, I wouldn't say that's a great idea unless you've really, you've fought in a number of them and you have an idea of how they flow, uh, but it can work. This is wrong down here. This is not Luttrell. This is actually both King Rene up here. I apologize for that. So on the field for a company level pot arms, usually the, you need a larger field for one thing. Um, and uh, the fencing really helps in this to define the space and make it clear that it's not just a regular tournament. Um, it does, however, create some, some cost involved in the fence if you do this. And, of course, there's a storage issue if you have to store the thing. Um, so um, I find these useful, but um, it's not absolutely required. It's just useful. The SCA has done this for a long time with, you know, the what sometimes gets called the Eric or the list ropes. 
Um, and it, that's a start in a much more compact way of doing the same thing, or at least a similar thing, I would say. The fence adds a lot, though. Um, and I'd be loath to get rid of it um, if I didn't have to. We didn't have one in Hawaii because we didn't have any storage space. So there was no ability to really come up with one. Um, Renee's book up here shows a double fence. And I've seen that done. We've done it a couple times in the Company of St. George. Um, the outer fence keeps people out. And the inner fence is where the combatants go, where the squires and sergeants would go. Um, sort of watch over the fighting. That was necessary in a Rene pause, we'll see, because he had a zillion horsemen jammed into one space. Uh, the picture below was for the old site for the Skull of St. George in Dallas, as we had as our fighting field, so the floor is rubber, and then we had the fence going around it, and the start of what was gonna be a two-sided gallery in the back, and we never quite got that before I got deployed. Um, but we did that to focus the stuff, and you can see the difference in how the fighting might change if it's done in a focused fighting field this way. Uh, it is very helpful. Um, so finding a site where you can do all this, if you're going to do a company level one, can be something of a challenge. You know, parks need permits, you might have to have port johns that sort of thing, parking, all of that stuff um, becomes more of an issue when you're doing a company level pot arms. Just like a regular SCA event, you've got to plan for all this stuff. Um, that's, those requirements are less uh, well known to people not in the SCA, to folks doing um, events at other, with HEMA or with um, SCOLA, but nonetheless, they're there. Um, so here's some examples of these things actually um, from the tournament company days shown around. So the pictures of the, with the red fence, those are from the Company of St. George in Southern California. Um, and you can see the role of a barrier between the combatants. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the red fencing all around the outside. Um, and then the combatants coming up um, in the middle here with the penner. She's making an introduction, introducing herself, carrying her colors out there, introducing herself to the Venons or she's a tenant actually in this case. Um, then you see the banners up around the pavilions here and the helmets sitting on the posts, all designed to sort of create that sort of chivalric focus. And then over here, we have two scenes. I didn't think I had any pictures from this, but it turns out I do. From the Pas de Set Travaux at Penzik, I couldn't tell you what year, a long time ago, more than 20 years ago, where we had seven tournament companies on the field at the same time. And we did that as a grand pa. So grandpa but um where we had all seven companies each one would sponsor a station and so you'd go from the school of saint george to the school of saint or the company of saint george to the company of saint michael to uh company of saint mark to the tenants of noble folly to the grand order of the peacocks and so on um everybody wore their best stuff and brought the things out it was a really interesting event although pacing was hard to control because of the sort of progression between the different stations um, we've done some uh, company level ones with seven sins that had stations that worked just fine. Um, but you need seven defenders, then one for each sin to be the defenders plus somebody to keep track of everything. So any questions at this point or comments? I have one real quick. Go for it, Josh. So for determining tenants and such, say if you're hosting a Skull a specific one, would it be appropriate for the gallery to declare who they believe should be the tenants? Uh, sure, that would work fine. There's nothing wrong with that mechanism at all. Um, obviously, the chief tenant would be the person who's probably having to test that day. Uh, so they should probably automatically be on that side, but then everybody else, yeah, they should make that however they want it to be. Um, I, if I were doing that, I would tend to put the senior folks as defenders so that the junior ones could challenge them, but that's not set in stone. Any other questions? All right, we're almost done here. So the declaration, this is the piece that happens before the pie. You set up and put who's defending, where you're gonna do it, uh, what the purpose is, and the conditions of combat. That's the minimum that's gotta be in the declaration. Um, and then the other things we talked about before are things to think about for the conditions. So what's the fighting form gonna be? Weapon and armor standards, if you've got different groups coming in, that could be an issue. Um, so it might need to be in the conditions. Um, and then how will the theme flow? Uh, sometimes that's in there too, talking about what the theme is um, and then what the prize expectations are. I don't like to declare the prize in advance because then people are fighting for that and not for renown, uh, but I've seen it work. So um, you know, people declare they're gonna offer a sword or a ring or something like that uh, for the victor. I think the best ones are stuff that you're gonna give away to your consort, but 
that's just me. Uh, certainly you can have stuff that the combatant's gonna take. And this stupid little thing is still on here, Luke Charles Salter. So, um, so that's the declaration. You circulate that in advance. Um, here's what you're gonna do. Here's what I'm gonna do that day. Then on the preliminaries, there's a couple things you might do. Uh, Renee shows you know, these grand processions of everyone moving in to sort of set the day. Um, some of the pot arms that happened in the 90s have these things. Um, and then you've got, in some cases, a helm show, which we'll see on the next slide, a helm show. That can be a two-edged sword because most people, uh, the idea of that is to see, make sure everyone's worthy for the tournament. And if everyone's well known to each other, that's not usually an issue. And if they're not well known to each other, you're opening the keg up for potential conflict there. I've seen that happen actually twice, um, where somebody didn't want somebody else to fight and they used that mechanism to air their complaint. Not, I think, the most appropriate, but it is historical. Um, and so that, the invocation itself would come right after that. So you do those things if you're gonna do them. Sometimes the helm shows the night before. Then the invocation is made and you welcome everybody, set the tone for the day, conduct the introductions, and then you usually read over the conditions of combat. Uh, and that's what's involved in the invocation. Gather everyone around, much like on a SA Crown Tournament or something. And then sometimes, I talked about this before, uh, we did a common sorry where we got everyone together. I think I've done this in the uh, School of St. George in Hawaii, at least as well, um, doing this same sort of thing. And that seemed to be a very popular mixer. So we've kept that through the years. So here's Renee's version of a helm show. Um, all the people around, you notice this fellow's helmet's been knocked down. It's not because the crest is too heavy. It's because he had some issue that somebody took issue with. They knocked his helmet over. Um, the ladies are running this, uh, supported by the, the patrons and the heralds. Um, so it can be fun. I've participated in a couple events with this, um, but I've also seen a couple things go sideways. So it's fun if you can get the time and, and leisure for one to set this up. I wouldn't spend a lot of time the morning of the pa doing this. If I had the night before where people were gathering, I'd probably do it there if we're gonna do it. So the passes, I talked about these mostly, but this is where the mechanics come in. So courses or rounds, I tend to call them passes. Um, each fan gets one challenge typically, um, which means that as a defender, you might get more than one challenge. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there's also no requirement on these, and I think it's actually not good if a tenant isn't challenged, to make sure they get a challenge in this context um, because they weren't challenged for a reason. So um, that tells them something right off. Um, and maybe some action needs to be taken if that's the case to figure out why that occurred. But um, I wouldn't specifically do it and I would definitely not encourage the Venons to choose somebody just because they hadn't been chosen. You know, fight who you wanna fight with what you wanna fight with. And that I would think yield the best result. Um, this is where you have to, Focus on the focus, renown, and flow, all those things together. So then I've got a listing here for the things that typically each passes have for second and third. That's a thing that we do that not everyone does. Um, this is where they line up. Then you do the fights. Um, and then the combatants um, ready. As soon as the fight's over, you should be ready to go. And when the pass is over, then the whole thing starts over. Sometimes there's an optional melee in there, as I talked about. I've preferred to do those as theme things. So. The melee is all sword in two hands this time. So people go out with that first blood to three or something like that. Um, that seems to work pretty well. And also let somebody win that sort of melee, which is nice. Now the gallery here, um, the gallery's job, historically, the lady's job, of course, is to inspire the combatants. So the gallery here, are you need to provide something for them to do and some way to integrate them into the day's activities. And typically a, a formal company level pot arms is very easy to do this. Um, although keeping everybody focused requires that flow we talked about. Um, so I've seen it done as a castle of love up to and including a full built plywood castle structure where the ladies were um, to be um, defended by the tenons and the venons were assaulting the castle all the way up through um, the sort of prizes and such that ladies give. The image here from Vanessa Codex shows them above with musical instruments and stuff, but enjoying the day and keeping part of the uh, part of the focus. Um, I found it operationally helpful to station the Knight of Honors I mentioned here up there. Um, I talked about the injured guy. Um, and there's a little bit of a warning because some silliness is good, but too much takes away from the day. So um, trying to strike that balance can be something of a challenge, but I think with education, you can get around that problem. 
Um, so the gallery is an important part. Uh, how you integrate it will depend on what you've done for the theme and who, you know, what the role is. If you're in a reenactment sort of environment where you've got a lot of ladies who'll come in coat hardies and hoopalons, that's easier to do. If you're trying to engage the general public, I wouldn't put them in the gallery because they don't know what's happening and don't understand the mechanisms. So it will depend on what you're doing and why um, people are there as to how I might address this. Do you have any questions on the gallery or the passes? All right. So I'm just going to click through these fairly fast. So the only comment on here that's really not on the previous one is that they, the use of gifting can be very helpful from the gallery's perspective. Uh, sometimes I'll give the gallery ribbons to give out to combatants. One time we had four ladies of the gallery who sewed dresses with bearing one of each of Fiori's animals. And their job was with their circle of ladies around them was to choose the combatant of the day who most exemplified that animal. Um, and then we did a presentation at the end. So there are ways to weave the gallery in that can be kind of fun. This is what King Rene's gallery looked like. You know, it's obviously this giant formal thing with the patrons here in the middle and then the gallery arrayed on either side. And for those of you who have ridden on horseback before, this is a very dense, if even possible, list of combatants in a very small space. Um, you can bet that that's clearly focusing things, sort of an extreme version of it. This poor guy, the, the herald in charge or the knight in charge, has to get out of dodge before they get going. These are ropes that get cut, and then every, as soon as the ropes are cut, people can go. Uh, this is a melee form of tournament rather than a single set of challenges, but it was part of the way that Rene thought that'd be a great way to do tournaments in the mid 15th century. You can see those little helmets that we saw before, and he's got the batons and everything. Um, so this is very much sort of a plaisance, as you might say, in, in period, sort of uh, with limits and for the pleasure of the fight, for the joie de combat. Um, and you've got some display. These devices would be relating to the nobles here in the center box and so on. This is Rene d'Anjou himself, and this is Rene's device up here. So uh, that's how Rene would have structured the thing if he had his brothers, and he may have, we don't know it. So what challenges do you have? Here are some that we've used before, I've seen used, that work really well. So the tree of shields is used as a focusing prop to give the options. So uh, historically, they've been in the manner of St. George and St. Michael, and historically I mean SCA companies, St. George, not medievally necessarily. Medievally, typically they were arms of war, arms of peace. So we've done both counted blows received, how many times you're hit, and or counted blows thrown. That works better with something like a spear or what have you, but it does work. And it's a very different style, two very different style of fights. And typically on those, you're going to have counted blows to the numbers of three or five. Um, seven's a bit too many. One is sometimes not enough, though I've had fights in both those categories that are good. So if you deliver well, you might be able to pull that off. Uh, armor counts can be interesting. That means a shot on the helmet or the breastplate, you don't worry about it. You just wait for a shot somewhere else. A lot of the harness fecting people are doing this, uh, working on worrying, uh, thinking about that as a format. Um, so it can work as well. Uh, fighting to satisfaction is my personal favorite. You basically decide when you're done. It's not to submission where you're knocked to the ground. This is where you just think you've been outmaneuvered, the fight's over. Um, I think it takes a little bit more experience to do this one, but I actually find it much more satisfying. I think I mentioned last time, I've actually called satisfaction before I was even hit with a guy that did a feint and I just sort of ducked and blinked. So yeah, okay, I wasn't in this at all. Um, we're gonna call that one, that's good. Um, but usually, I've been in other ones where you've just taken hits and taken hits, but it doesn't feel like the fight's over. So it does take some judgment on how to do that. I wouldn't use that much unless you had a, a marshal whose job it was to sort of come over and throw a white baton if you've done enough already, because um, you don't want to task everybody else's patience. Um, grappling and thrusting, typically I've used a ribbon technique for this. So if I, people are willing to do grappling and they're qualified for it, they wear X colored ribbon as a tenon. This means that they're going to be willing to do it and they're able to do it, uh, but even then you need to be careful with this if you're going to allow it. Same thing for thrusting. Um, and then the use of the barriers. We see here a picture from the very dawn of the 15th century of a siege, and this is in between bouts of the siege during a period probably of something just boredom and truce. These guys are fighting each other with spears during the truce um, as a feat, of, a feat of arms in its own right. Defending the castles is a feat of arms, and so is the, uh, the besieging actions. But um, the reason the barriers are up there is because one time in the 13th century, this had been a tradition, 
One time the guys inside rode out to do the feat of arms and the guys who were besieging rode in. <laughs> so the tradition came up, hey, let's use this barrier. And so we've sort of adopted that and gradually increased the barrier fighting um, on the field um, and included that as one of the ways that people might challenge. During the St. Crispin's Day pot arms in 1992, we made the barrier, put it out in the field, and the entire first pass, everybody with a couple pole axes crossed on it. Well, nobody really fought any pole axe, nor had they fought over a barrier. So no one really knew what to expect. The whole first pass, nobody touched that thing, kind of scared to look at it. Um, but the last fight was made with pole axes at the barrier, and everyone had such a great time. Uh, passes two and three were all almost exclusively done at the barrier, because people enjoyed it so much. Uh, the nice thing about it is that you know you're not as worried about leg harness things so in an environment where you're not wearing leg harnesses it's actually a cool format um, the downside is you probably don't want people to be able to back off from the barrier too much or you might have a very long waiting game so i usually put a barrier behind them so they can't get out of range um, and so these would be ways that you might have assigned to one of your shields and you might have other ones that you think of too but these are ones that we've done before so a combatant would come up and say i'll challenge you to a fight with spears in the manner of saint george to the counted blows numbering of five and so you throw five blows and the number who lands the most would win or to satisfaction with pole axes um, if you want to do a really special one you could say i challenge you in the manner of saint george with three blows each with dagger sword in one hand and spear you don't do more than one of those a tournament uh, per person whoops sorry about that um, because it'll take too long but as a capstone thing or somebody you really want to honor uh, that's a good technique to use so these are all ones that i've seen used with good effect um, and you could do them in any of these sort of formats we talked about any questions about these all right so this is what can happen on a Rene field that spilled out and went outside the field. Um, so clearly his list wasn't quite big enough. Um, but, you know, no one's on the ground. Um, everyone's still fighting, exchanging blows back and forth. So one of the things here, of course, is on prizes. Um, this is where we talked about last time a little bit, where the, the idea is that you'll have multiple cases for showing renown. So you don't necessarily have a single winner, but you could choose one. Um, Bernd, as you pointed out last time, that is done. So um, you potentially you can have a victor. The gallery can choose it. The combatants can choose it. The tenons can choose from the venons. If the venons get together, they could choose from the tenons if they like. Um, I would typically not mandate that for the venons. I'd let them come up with that on their own if they want to do it. Because if I'm a tenon, I don't want to suggest that we should get a prize. So um, if they want to do it, that's fine. But um, tenons, I almost always do it from the tenons' point of view. Um, that's where Charnay's quote comes in. Um, now, this is, I think, the story of Jeffrey Mathias and the Silver Ring here is pretty useful. When we did the first pot arms in 1992, uh, Jeffrey Mathias, at that time a squire, um, came to the event uh, in his barboot and 15th century Italian cuirass and such, looked great, um, fought some great fights with the, in the pot, and then we did a big feast at the end. We had uh, roast pig and used a church hall, so had gothic architecture and all that. It was fantastic. Um, and Jeffrey stood up after the first course and said, when I heard tell that there was to be a feat of arms, I decided to make a silver ring and wear it until such time as I saw a feat of arms that was inspiring enough to me where I would give that ring away. Um, guys done this historically with a grieve or something like that, uh, or a ring. Jeffrey did this perfectly, delivered it perfectly, called out the individual at the feast we wanted to honor, and that sort of upped the bar for everybody. It was like, oh, this is what we should be doing. And so that started the tradition of personal gift giving. And so there's a good opportunity there for chivalric gestures during the tournament, after the tournament, um, at the feast, uh, what have you. Um, that's just as important, I think, because I don't even remember who he gave the ring to, honestly. So <laughs> Jeffrey actually won more renown than the person he gave the ring to because of the gesture. Um, so I think there's a, a good way to do that. Um, and then if you're gonna do a feast at the end, um, this is a good time to do chivalric discussion. So, talking about things from Charnay or Lull, the Tree of Battles. Sometimes I'll have a reading from that and we'll then talk about that. Um, if you're gonna do a feast, of course, this requires a staff to run the kitchen, to do all this stuff. You need to collect money or someone's gotta pay for it. Um, we had that at the first event. Uh, the ladies were kind enough uh, to put together a really sumptuous sort of feast, um, so that was great. But the whole point of that dinner is supposed to be to continue the inspiration from the day into the final wee hours of the morning and then on to going home. It sets all those lessons and all those observations and all that renown 
more firmly in people's minds. Um, so whatever you do at the feast, it should probably try and focus that. And people should be talking about what other people did during the course of the event, not what they did. So this is a picture from Renee showing the ladies offering a, it looks like a gold set of feathers to the victor of the tournament. Um, nothing wrong with that, very uh, sort of medieval gesture on their part. And um, there's nothing saying you only have to have one victor either, um, but um, one grand prize is often, especially in the 15th century, becomes sort of a traditional part of the thing. So we've covered a ton. Let's go back a little bit. Um, any questions on prizes or the bouts back to here or um, the sort of, sort of capstoning of renown, any of those things? Any comments? All right, so these are all places you can go. We have all the chroniques um, on the Skull of St. George site as back issues. On there are a lot of the different tournament um, convoc or invocations and declarations are in there because they were published in there for a long time. The Rene books, very helpful if you can find them. Um, they're probably somewhat online. There might even be an English version online, although the English translation is, can be kind of interesting. And then these tournament books are also useful just to get a sort of an idea. You might go to romances also, uh, pick those up um, because you want to set the sort of romantic tone. Remember these things are anchored in romance typically. Um, and then here's the real source slide that looks all grunky, you need to clean that up. Um, I'll publish this as a regular document as well. And then we're at the end. So do we have any questions across the board from anything we talked about today? Or commentary is fine too. One question from Brian Hischelbach. Sure. Oh, I see it. Thank, thanks, Josh. So the uh, School of St. George is a, um, we call it a school of chivalric martial arts. So it's anchored in the 15th century treatises of Fiori de la Berry. And the idea is that we teach the fighting as a, chivalric, as a martial art. Um, and we're what we call application agnostics. So those techniques are useful as combatives or in the SCA or um, in HEMA or what have you. Uh, we don't really anchor in any of those things and our combatants typically um, have a variety of interests depending upon where they're from, what group they're in. Um, founded in the year 2000, um, you can find mostly stuff about that at skullofstgeorge.org. Um, and that was an offshoot of the company of St. George, which was founded in 92, which was a tournament company once we began to be aware that the fighting treatises were out there, we knew before, but we weren't doing anything with them. Um, then we started to split off the Skull of St. George as a related group um, to look at that as a martial art. Because a lot of the guys in the uh, company of St. George wanted to continue their anchoring, their main martial focus in an SCA context. So we decided to spin the Skull off as something different, um, but related. And in the process, we kind of dropped the ball, I think, a little bit on keeping the company of St. George going. So that's a regret I have. Um, but the school is alive and well now with branches um, in Atlanta and Savannah, um, down in uh, Josh's Way, Hawaii, Dallas, here in Montgomery, and other places too. Um, so uh, we try to set up branches that um, follow our curriculum and then connect either by video and or at our annual symposia. So that's kind of in a nutshell what the what the school of St. George is. Feel free, Bradley, if you want to send me an email afterwards, I can chat with you offline about that more. Any other questions? I did have one for some of the videos that Feel sent you probably months ago. Just want to talk with you offline after. Sure. So what's the issue, Josh? Uh, not an issue, just a uh, discussion of uh, how some of my guys have done for video I've sent you. I'm just give Okay, yeah, we'll talk about that after, sure. No problem. All right. If I don't have any more questions, I'll cook this thing and we'll post it. Um, feel free to send me questions after those. Sometimes they occur later. This is just meant sort of as a starting point um, for understanding where these things come from and how they kind of run. Uh, there's a lot more we could talk about, but um, this is probably a lot of time for now. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. See you online and in person. Online after the pandemic is over.
Thank you. My pleasure. Good to see you, BJ. Good Hi, Carolyn. Bye. Hey, you. Hey, John. And Andrew, yay. Hello.